Hey, so glad that you're here, genuinely. No matter where you're walking in on your spiritual journey, you are loved, safe, and welcome in this community. And our mission here at City Church is to help people find their way to God from where they are. So that means our heartbeat is simply to meet you where you are, help you take some next steps, whatever that might mean for you today. So genuinely glad that you're here. It's November. Christmas is coming. Oh man, here we go. I'm pumped about it. Thanksgiving is around the corner. Did you guys hear how much urgency Maddie put into the Food for Families deadline? That's because this morning I was unaware of that deadline. And so everybody's making sure, like, dude, if Drake doesn't know, no one knows. So I'm signing up for a bag this week, and we're bringing our food items when? Next Sunday, dropping it off in the lobby. So cool, guys. Our Food for Families initiative is not just like dropping off a bag at a front door. This is a time where we get to actually engage with these families, resource them in multiple ways, connect them in community. And so right now we have 87 families that we get to serve as a community together. So thank you for your radical generosity on the front end. Put your hands together again for that. That's so cool. Really glad you guys are here. Hey, so we are in the middle of a series on the Holy Spirit, and it's been um, a couple of weeks now. So on the front end, three weeks, four weeks, we spent time talking about who is the Holy Spirit, and then we transitioned a couple of weeks ago into the stuff that the Spirit does. And so there's some pretty transitional teachings on the front end and in the middle of this, and so you can go back, catch up on the podcast, YouTube channel, all of that, in order to kind of see where we are. The titles kind of give it away of what we've been talking about. But if you would have told me a year ago that today or in this season right now we would be walking our church through this series, I would have laughed and maybe felt a little bit uncomfortable because I I would have lined up with the words that Paul shared a couple weeks ago, which is, man, I just feel uninformed. Like when it comes to, you know, I, I I believe the scriptures, I believe God wants to do stuff in and through our lives, I believe in the power of God, all of that was true of me, Um, but I also feel uninformed in a lot of it. And so we're kind of in this space of like, how do we walk into all that God has for us when I told you at the beginning of the series, I'm kind of on this journey with you together. Like, like you can't lead someone where you've never been. And so we're just kind of like in this thing together, learning and growing. And it's been incredible watching all that God has done already. You guys agree? Super awesome. Put your hands together for God and his activity in and through this community already. So a recap, just where we're going today. Le- learning, we've been learning to grow in our relationship with God through the presence, power, and, and person of the Holy Spirit. This relationship. The Holy Spirit's not a force like Star Wars that you tap into when you're in a pinch. But this is a person that you have a relationship with. And we, we, we've been over this overarching goal for the year as a church. We, we, we've been asking the big question, what does it mean to follow Jesus, to be a Jesus follower. And it's really important, depending on your background, what you've been exposed to, who, who you've hung around, you might answer that question differently. But for, our, uh, for us, we, we had a formational series, vision series at the beginning of this year called Followers. And we said, what does it mean to be with Jesus or, or to, rather to follow Jesus, to have a relationship with Jesus? And we said it was three things. It's first to be with Jesus. The invitation is first into relationship with Jesus through faith and trust. It is then to become like Jesus. So, so we, we talked about this all, the, all throughout the year. It's like, okay, it's time daily, intimately in the scriptures and in prayer with God through different practices and disciplines. It's community, it's teaching, all shaping us through the power of the Spirit into who we're becoming. And we asked over and over again, like it's, it's November, right? So things start to get blurry in the holiday season. And so you and I will look up and we'll rem- remember that we should probably pay attention to the pace of our life about mid-January. And then we'll ask once again, even though it means nothing to anybody, just because it's New Year's resolution time, like, who am I becoming? And we want to ask that over and over again, like, who are you becoming? Because you're being formed every day, whether you like it or not. And so we, we ask that question, are we being intentionally formed? And ultimately, all of this is pointed to, again, what does it mean to follow Jesus? It's be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and ultimately to do what Jesus did with his power working in and through us. And so that's where we are in this series Currently, you guys with me? Tracking with me? Perfect. Um, so, um, last week I introduced uh, our, our passage in 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to be there again today, so you can go ahead and open up the Bibles in your seat backs in front of you or your phone or follow along on the screen. But 1 Corinthians 14, Paul kicked it off by saying, Hey, here's the encouragement. I want you to eagerly desire all the stuff that the Spirit wants to do in and through you. And so one, there was this big list in 1 Corinthians 12 a couple weeks ago, like all the stuff the Spirit does. Do you guys remember that? If you missed it, you can go back and catch it. It's super helpful. Um, but right, there's all kinds of stuff, like prophecy and healing and miraculous and like all, all kinds of cool stuff happening. One of the stuffs of the Spirit, one of the manifestations of the Spirit that we see throughout the New Testament scriptures, as well as in the early church, is this phenomenon of, it's, it's called speaking in tongues. You guys heard of that before? 
speaking in tongues, which literally in the Greek is translated other languages, okay? So uh, I made a joke about making out like two weeks ago, and like I got an awkward chuckle about it. So speaking in tongues or, or other languages is the, the literal translation there. And this is one of those topics that swings the spectrum of, of like abuse to ambiguity. And I would say just probably from the temperature of our own church, it, it lands in that ambiguity, uh, lots of like it just sounds weird. Like, what are we talking about? And so before we get into the conversation today on this expression, this manifestation of the Spirit, let me take you to Ephesians 5, because this is an important encouragement from Paul. So before we get into the conversation on these other languages, um, here's Paul's encouragement. He's kind of talking about what it means to follow Jesus, giving in some encouragement around walking in the light and not in the darkness, and how do you love well in the world in time and day, City Church, Boulder, Colorado, 2022, in just your time and space, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And in a, in a bunch of different spaces of encouragement, he, he pins the words, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And what's really, I just want to give you this on the front end because this word filled is, in, is a passive command and it's also in the ongoing present active tense. So when Paul writes to followers of Jesus to be filled with the Spirit, this is a passive command, meaning this is not something that you do for yourself. Right, we talked about this over and over again. You don't work yourself up into an emotional frenzy, frenzy and try to like get to a place to where you're really feeling the things of the Spirit. There's nothing wrong with feelings and experience, but that's not what he's saying. To be filled with the Spirit is a passive command, meaning you and I open up our lives and let the Spirit do this in us, to fill us up. You guys tracking with me? But it's also in the ongoing active present tense, meaning you don't do this just once. It's like, oh yeah, I did that one time. This is the same tense used when we see the command to love one another, which is kind of a big deal. Would you agree? Right? When we read that command, we're like, oh, yeah, I, I did that that one time. Loved somebody. I don't ever have to do it again. Check box, right? No, it's an active thing, meaning this is how we live life. This is something we do ongoing. To love one another is a disposition of the heart and the mind and the hands. In the same tense, to be filled with the Spirit is not something that you do, but the, the Spirit of God does for you. Open up your life to that daily, consistently, intimately. And it's something we do over and over and over again, as in every single day you and I wake up and in a simple breath prayer say, fill me again. And so this is this ongoing pursuit of this relationship with the Holy Spirit, of, of him filling our lives, as in I'm going to empty myself out, God, and you fill me up. And so I, I just want to just context-wise, it is right and it is good to seek more of the Holy Spirit. You guys tracking with me on this? It's just the disposition of our hearts to be eager, like Paul says, is where we're leaning into as a church. And so, again, this is, there's a, it's a good thing to want more of God, to practice this, to grow in it. That's where we are as a church. Now, Back to the conversation around tongues. The reason I brought that up is because there's what, what I would call some false teachings around this conversation that I'm going to give you on the front end. But if you're reading the book of Acts, which you can go on your own, it's amazing, especially in the light of this series, it might be really helpful for you just like a chapter a day out of the book of Acts and watch all that God is doing. But there are 22 different stories in the book of Acts and your New Testament alone that speak to people being filled with the Spirit. Okay, you might have heard that language depending on if you've been around church for a minute or not. Um, but here's what's interesting is only three out of the 22 stories in the book of Acts are, are simultaneously someone being filled with the Spirit and then speaking in tongues as a result. Okay? So there's this kind of phenomenon of speaking in tongues that goes hand in hand with being filled with the Spirit, but it's only three out of the 22 experiences in, in the New Testament scriptures that we see in Acts. You guys tracking with me on that? Here's why this matters, is because there are a couple of three false teachings around tongues that we reject as a church, and, and I know that's pretty strong language, but I, but I, think, uh, I think this is the language that we need for, for what we're talking about. So number one, very simply, um, if you're taking notes, um, the first false teaching would be, if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not filled with the Spirit. We reject that idea completely as a church. There's not good scriptural basis for that. I, I, I've seen and danced around it all. I've been in this journey for a long, long time, and this is simply not true. There are some veins, uh, um, and, and this is not to speak to any denominations or anything like that, right? Like, we don't have it all figured out here, so this is a lot of humility in the process, but there are some uh, um, Christian veins that would say that you're kind of like a second-class citizen when it comes to being a Jesus follower if you don't speak in tongues. Like the evidence of God's spirit and power in your life is this speaking in tongues thing, and if you don't have it, like, yeah, Jesus loves you, and yeah, he's made you new, but you're like really lacking the power of God in your life. And I just want you to know we, we reject that. 
that this gift is not related to you having the Holy Spirit or not. Uh, number two, the second false teaching that we reject as a church is that if you don't speak in tongues, this is like the extreme version of that same vein, is if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Ooh, you're not, you're, not, you're not in God's family. You're not in the kingdom of heaven or whatever language you want to use. And this is the extreme version of, of this conversation, but um, there are people who would say that, that the evidence of you having a relationship with God, like the emphatic evidence that you need, how do I know if I'm a Jesus follower? How do I know if God loves me and I've done this faith thing and trusted in him? They would say the evidence is that you would speak in tongues. And if you don't do that, then, then guess you don't have it yet. You can try a little harder, have a little more faith or whatever their encouragement might be, but we reject that completely. Uh, we, we think it's completely contradictory, contradictory to the scriptures. And then lastly, hard swing the other way. Uh, we reject the teaching that speaking in tongues is not for today because we now have the Bible. Sweet. Uh, there's this cool little vein called cessationism. You guys heard of that? Um, it's this idea that, that with the completing of the canon of scriptures that you, you and I have today, like all the stuff the Spirit does, especially like the miraculous stuff, it has ceased. Cessationism, you guys get that? And, and, um, and so this is the idea that, that all these things are rejected. It's a, an incredibly poor argument uh, from scripture. It's, it's not even a remotely good one, and so we reject it completely. Um, we think that when we're reading 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, um, that those are words not only for the church in Corinth, but for us today, Okay. Now, just a heads up, because uh, we say often here at City Church, like, like, like we're charismatic with a seatbelt in this vein, okay? Like, I want to be open to all the stuff the Spirit does, um, but, but just definitely reject all the weird, crazy, or abusive stuff that you see or have seen or heard of uh, when it comes to conversations around uh, the life in the Spirit. Um, but when it comes to cessationism, you know, you might, like, reject that, like, okay, it's in the scriptures, therefore I have to believe it. But then functionally, you're like, it's a space of, like, I'm open but, has, like, cautious, which basically means I'm open because I have to be because it's in the scriptures, but I have no idea. And so basically I, I, I reject it personally just because I don't know what it means, open but cautious. So wherever you are in that, it's fine, uh, wherever you find yourself today. But I just want to give you a heads up that this kind of space, this thinking of cessationism, um, it, it becomes self-fulfilling. And, and so if you don't believe in, in the work of the Spirit of God, like if you don't believe that the Spirit of God wants to do this stuff in and through us as a community and you as a follower of Jesus, then there's a good chance you won't see it. Right? Like if you don't believe that God's heart is inclined toward the miraculous and to healing, then why would you pray for someone's healing when they're dying of cancer? If you don't believe in, in the gift of prophecy, then why would you ask God for a word of encouragement for someone? Right, it, it just becomes self-fulfilling. Self -fulfilling. And so, um, again, just, just a space. This is just to kind of know where we are today. No pressure whatsoever, wherever you find yourself. So, again, now here we are. What does the New Testament have to say about this conversation, this thing about uh, the, this phenomenon of tongues? Okay, so 1 Corinthians 14 is where we're going to be. Um, this is a dialogue, super complex. We don't have time to get into all of it today. Um, but, but Paul is going back and forth, kind of a compare and contrast of the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. And, and really, it's instructions on what to do and not to do when you gather together as the church in a, in a large or, or a smaller gathering. But this is not about your personal life. And so for the Corinthians, what, the reason he's writing to them is because they're like wild and out of control, and they're abusing the gifts, kind of like the exact opposite of Western Boulder, Colorado, 22 where we're just like super contemplative and we sit back and we, you know, we're not even sure if we should raise our hands in worship, much less be open to the stuff the Spirit does. So we're in the opposite camp at times. Um, but as he's having this conversation, last week we learned that for Paul, he said that prophecy is way more important when it comes to the, these two uh, uh, different gifts. And so we, we talked about it in 1 Corinthians 12. You can go back and listen to it. The gifts of the Spirit, like this is the, the best translation is not like gifts as in like you get one and you get another, but the stuff the Spirit does, as in this is open to everyone. Um, and so this word, this word tongues, it's glossa in Greek, and it literally means other languages. And, and so what we're going to do is as we walk through 1 Corinthians 14 today, I highlighted the word tongues every time it, every time it comes up. And so what I want you to do is, is just kind of in your mind, we're going to translate that together, other languages, just to kind of take some of the weird out of what in the world are we talking about. Um, but to be clear, it's not just another language like Spanish or Portuguese, okay? Um, so let me give you two definitions that we're working with today before we get into the text. So number one is from John Mark Comer. Um, he said that the manifestation of the Spirit through the gift of tongues is a form of prayer and praise. 
that you express to God in a language that you don't understand. So it's a very simple definition that we'll be working with. The second one is from N.T. Wright, super wicked smart Bible scholar guy. Um, And this is a really helpful fleshing out definition of what we're talking about today. He says, tongues, when you see that word in the scriptures, it refers to the gift of speech, which through making sounds and using apparent or even actual languages, so it's open to, to both, somehow bypasses the speaker's conscious mind. He goes on, and he says, such speech is experienced as a stream of praise in which Though the speaker may not be able to articulate precisely what is being said, a sense, this is really important, a sense of love for God, of adoration and gratitude wells up and overflows. It is like a private language of love, or you might have heard it called a private prayer language. So this is the definition that they do a good job of kind of fleshing this out for us, okay? So you guys ready to jump into the text? All right, here we go. Verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. Or again, that's one word in the Greek, right? Pneumaticos, the stuff the Spirit does, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in another language or other languages does not speak to people but to God. You see it? He's giving us instructions on what this is about. Indeed, no one understands them. They, they utter mysteries by the Spirit, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening encouraging, and comfort. He goes on, verse four, and he says, anyone who speaks in another language edifies themselves, builds themselves up, but the one who prophesies edifies the church, builds other people up. I would, listen to this, I would like every one of you to speak in other languages. That's Paul's heart for you and I today. But I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church might be edified and or built up. So five quick things from the text here, just, just so you're kind of tracking with me, right? These other languages are to God, not people. Sorry for the blinky TV. I realize it's like a little rave party behind me, but just embrace it. Uh, these other languages are to God, not to people. Uh, number two, these languages don't make sense to you as the speaker. Uh, Number three, again, this is just from the text. Uh, These languages, they edify, or like this is a construction word. Like I don't know how many of you are are good at swinging hammers, but like to literally build something up. These languages are to build up the speaker, not the church, not others. This is interesting. So like life tears you down, right? I mean, just a normal seven-day week, and you just drag yourself to church or to city group or to bed or out of bed or whichever space you're in. Um, and he's saying, hey, this, this phenomenon, this, this gift of the Spirit, it builds you up. And it's interesting because this is the only manifestation of the Spirit that is for you personally and not for someone else. Everything else in 1 Corinthians 12 is for the church. This is the only one that builds you up personally. Uh, number four, observation-wise, um, he says it's not nearly as important as prophecy, which is really important that we emphasize that. Um, but then number five, ideally, everyone would speak in these other languages, says Paul. This is for everybody. He says, oh, yeah, I, you know, I wish everybody would do it. I'm like, hmm, okay. Verse 6, let's move on. <laughs> See what else Paul has to say. Um, he goes on. He says, now, brothers and sisters, he, this is three metaphors he's going to give us to help us understand what's going on. Brothers and sisters, if I come to you and I speak in another language, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction, something helpful? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as the pipe or the harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is distinction in the note? Speaking to music, he goes on. Uh, Verse 8, yeah, again, if the trumpet doesn't sound, speaking of kind of like battle and war, think Lord of the Rings, cool. If the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You'll just be speaking into the air. That's a good point, Paul. He goes on. Um, he says, undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. So if, if then I don't grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I'm a foreigner to that speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. Um, We'll stop there for a second. So three, three, um, three different metaphors that Paul uses to help us understand what he's talking about. Number one, he uses music, right? Like so, so music, in order to be helpful to you, like for you to enjoy music, it has to have a key and meter or, or rhythm, right? Like in order for music to be enjoyable, to make sense, for you to start a little head bobbing a little bit, bend in the knees, right? It's actually got to have some structure to it. And so he uses that as like an example. So I, I have a little gift for you here. Hold on. Check this out. 
Yeah, I think I got it. We did not practice this, so no promises. Um, but I've got a sweet, flowery guitar strap. Oh, there we go. Can I just stand here? Is that okay? Perfect. Daniel's like, don't mess up my chords. All right, so just, just helping you understand. He, again, he's speaking to this gift. He's like, hey, if it doesn't make sense, then, then no one's built up. So um, this is going to be a little tune for you. No, no key and no meter. You guys ready? You're going to be blown away. That wasn't bad. Let's get in a little, little swankier key. Yeah, you can turn it down a little bit. We don't have to kill anybody today. How many of you guys were just totally moved by that, right? Like, Spirit of God in this place, right? So, so that's uncomfortable and terrible, and no one wants to listen to that. But, you know, a little something different, like... Anybody? Let's go. Yeah, let's go. All right, that's all you get. Um, maybe another day, a little bit of uh, back in black or something for you, but today, that's all my hips can handle. So, um, as built up as you were by that, um, his point is, hey, listen, like, just like music, this thing has a lane that it stays in. It's, it's got a way that it's helpful and a way that it's not helpful. In the same way, he says, like, it's like a trumpet. So, Lord of the Rings, trumpets are how you're communicating. Flank left, flank right, go forward, stop, retreat, right? And, and literally, what happens? If, if the sound is unclear from the trumpet in battle, he, he's saying, like, that's actually dangerous. I mean, I mean, to the point that, like, people could be killed. So he's saying, hey, listen, like, this gift, it matters how it's used. And out of alignment with what, what God wants to do in and through us, it could actually be dangerous to you and to community. But the last one, he says, it's kind of like a foreign language, uh, which we all have familiarity with. So where's, where's Albert in the room? Albert, yeah, come on. You guys, give, your, give it get up for Albert. Um, so I asked Albert to put together a word of encouragement for you this morning to build you up. So... Albert, take it away. Buenos días. Me gustaría compartir con ustedes la entrada de mi diario en agosto. Tal vez te identifiques y encuentres ánimo como lo hice yo. Wow, hace cuatro meses que no escribo en este diario. Tomó un día libre del trabajo para encontrar tiempo para escribir en mi diario. ¿Por qué insisto en estar ocupado en lugar de a acercarme a ti y pasar más tiempo contigo. Sé que Dios tiene sentido de humor porque me, después de escribir esto, me dio la respuesta, abrí mi devocional y esto leí. Durante las pruebas, es bastante fácil caer en la trampa de buscar algo que sea una distracción. Esto se llama escapismo. Tendemos a buscar cosas que creemos que nos ayudarán a a no concentrarnos en nuestro dolor. Estas cosas nunca nos dan paz, pero proporciona una sensación de alivio, lo que hace que pasemos más tiempo con estas cosas que con Dios. Mientras reflexionaba, me di cuenta de que esto es muy cierto para mí y quizás para algunos de ustedes también. Me mantengo ocupado en el trabajo y luego me pierdo en la televisión esto me ayuda a no concentrarme en mi situación la mayor parte del tiempo. Pero es increíble cómo el Santo Espíritu me guía a pesar de que estoy distraído. Mi fijación sobre lo que la dispara el futuro a mi sobrina es un callejón sin salida y no sé qué hacer. A la mujer ustedes están pasando por algo duro también, pero ¿sabes qué? A veces ya tenemos las herramientas, solo tenemos que aplicarlas. Cada tormenta termina, cada túnel oscuro termina en luz. Dios permanece fiel. Tenemos que buscarlo a través de nuestras circunstancias. Hmm. Well done, well done. Put your hands together for Albert. Wasn't that, I mean, just amazing? I mean, have you, were you like not so encouraged and built up? Anybody understand that in the room? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you guys don't count, um, but to everybody else, <laughs> um, there's a gap, right? About 30 seconds in, you guys, it's kind of uncomfortable. You're like, what are we, 
What, what, what's the benefit here? Now, Albert, I asked him to share that in English for all of us who are not gifted in that manner to actually build you up. So one more time from Albert. Good morning. Uh, I would like to share with you my journal entry that I made in August. Uh, maybe you'll relate and find encouragement like I did. Wow, it's been four months since I've written in this journal. It took a day off from work to find time to journal. Why do I insist on being busy instead of coming to you and spending more time with you? Now, I know God has a sense of humor because after writing this, I opened my devotional and read this. During trials, it is quite easy to fall into the trap of looking for something to be a diversion. This is called escapism. We tend to seek things we believe will help us not focus on our pain. These things never give us peace, but provide a sense of relief resulting in us spending more time with those things than God. While reflecting, I realize this is very true of me and perhaps some of you. I stay busy at work and then I lose myself in television. This helps me not focus on my situation most of the time. But it is incredible how your Holy Spirit guides me even though I'm distracted. My fixation on what the future holds for my knees is an impasse and I don't know what to do. Perhaps you're dealing with something hard, but you know what? Sometimes we already have the tools, we just need to apply them. Every storm ends, every dark tunnel ends in light, God remains faithful, we need to seek Him despite our circumstances. Yeah. Thank you, Albert. How many of you were built up by that? You were encouraged, it moved you. Yeah, so practical, he shared that with me, and I'm like, oh, you gotta share it. You can see the gap. I mean, it's meant to be glaringly obvious here. So Paul is helping us understand, hey, listen, this gift has a lane, and it matters how you use it. Now, before you, you think, oh, man, like, okay, cool, so we're going to put up the roadblocks on, on, on the expression, the manifestation of tongues. No, like, Paul's for it, just in the right lane. So verse 13, here we go. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 12. So it is with you, since you're eager for the gifts of the Spirit, Try to excel in those that build up the church. For this reason, the one who speaks in another language should pray that they, may, they might interpret what they say. For if, a, if, if I pray in another language, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. He goes on. In verse 15, yes. Uh, so what, what should I do? He asks, like trying to figure out how to, how to use this. I'll pray with my spirit, but I'll also pray with my understanding. I'll sing with my spirit, but I'll also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving since they don't know what you are saying? So a couple of quick observations again from this text. He says, hey, if and when you speak, he, he says, you should, it's just, this is for the gathering, right? Pray for an interpretation. You need an interpreter, otherwise don't use it. Um, he also says something about like, kind of like as you're in this space and, and if God will do this through you, that your mind is kind of in neutral. Not, not like turned off, you're not in a trance, but, but specifically like, your mind doesn't comprehend what's being said or spoken or prayed. And so some people think this is like actual other languages, and actually I've heard stories of both, of someone's in a foreign country, and they're speaking a language that they do not know. I was talking to Billy. Billy and Gina are getting ready to go to uh, overseas to like Central Asia, and they've got to learn the language, and he's like, it'd be really cool if God would just like <laughs> do this. Do, you know, if I didn't have to learn it, that'd be amazing, right? So that does happen. Uh, some people think it's other languages. Some people think it's like... Uh, uh, angelic languages or, or like a spiritual language kind of from Paul's language of in 1 Corinthians 13 he talks about it like that um, either way the, the point is you don't know what you're saying as the speaker that's the point you guys with me on that so so that, that's just kind of helping us understand and then whatever whatever this this manifestation of the spirit is um, it's, it's a form of prayer and praise that's what we get from Paul here it's a form of prayer and praise and so he's saying I sing with my mind and my spirit right what happens songs on the screen and you're singing with your mind and there's a cognitive embrace and then there's a, a singing in the spirit maybe where you don't know the words is he saying I'm doing both no he goes on verse 17 he says, you are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. Again, they're abusing this gift, right? They're coming all together, talking like crazy, pe freaking people out, and so they have no idea what to do. And he's, he's trying to correct them. He says, I thank God, listen, I thank God that I speak in tongues or other languages more than all of you. But in the church, again, this is instructions for the gathering, I would rather speak five intelligible words. Jesus loves you, <laughs> you know, Lord. And he rose again, whatever. I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in another language. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In, in regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. This is Paul saying, guys, grow up. 
You're abusing this. It's about you and not what God wants to do. And so Paul's heavy emphasis here is, is hey, the goal is to build up others. But he's not down on this gift. So again, I think the, Christ, the, the Corinthians, they assume that they're more spiritual than Paul. That's kind of the abuse and why he's having to write to them. And so he actually just writes, hey, just a heads up, I actually do this more than all of you. So, so I mean, just if we're, you know, never mind, I'm not going to go there. But if, if we're, you know, if we're in that lane, just a heads up. But more, more than anything, he says, I want to be helpful. That's the point. Every manifestation of the Spirit is to build others up. Um, and so Paul says, yeah, I do this a lot, and a lot. It's great and it's vital. But in a gathering, I don't do it because I want to benefit you. So real quick, my story. Um, started following Jesus at 15. I've been in churches and circles where uh, cessationism was taught for a moment. I think they moved away from that when, when you know, they got blasted with the inability to actually hold that up in Scripture. But then it was like that open but cautious, like, okay, it's in the Bible, so we have to believe it but we don't know what to do with it. And we're also kind of intimidated and freaked out by it. And so we're definitely not gonna talk about it. And in the safest zone, it's like, yeah, it could be real other foreign languages in another country and that happens to other people, but not us. <laughs> that was the space maybe of a conversation around this in particular. Um, and I have asked, so, so I've had lots of time walking with Jesus over a decade and I've asked Jesus for uh, this, this gift or this expression, this manifestation of the spirit many times in the course of you know, being with Jesus since 2005 and never. Have I had uh, th- this, this opportunity or this manifestation in my life until about two months ago? Um, and so I go to our staff, and, I'm, and I've, I've been praying, just, just like we're in the space. Hey, God, I'm open. If you want to do this, again, Paul says, hey, he, the Spirit of God does this to whoever he wills, so you're welcome to ask for it and see what happens. And so I was asking God for it about two months ago, and singing and praying and kind of in a space of getting quiet, and then I'm like, I think... Maybe that just happened. And so then I start processing and I go to our staff and I'm like, hey guys, I'm pretty sure that I prayed in tongues for like 30 minutes the other day. Um, and it freaked me out in a good way, right? And I was like, I don't know what to do with it. And so, so he, here's, here's just the space. Um, here's what I've learned in the process, really new for me, okay? I just opened, it just happened to, to be in a space where I can have a little bit of, of experience in it. So what I've found is that it does build me up like Paul was saying, right? Like uh, kind of in a space if you're emotionally or spiritually just kind of, burnt or down, um, praying in tongues, um, kind of lets you start to praise God in a space that maybe your mind can't get to. You ever just feel like your mind is in the way? Like, right, you're just kind of, it's so heady and life is happening. And so it builds you up genuinely. Um, sometimes, have you ever been there? You ever like run out of stuff to pray? Like you're praying for something and you just don't know what to pray anymore? You're like, yeah, like three minutes in, <laughs> like to prayer time. Yep, I'm like, and that's it, God, that's all I got. And so I've, I've been in situations lately, or like uh, Albert was sharing about his niece, uh, who is uh, disabled, and, and it's uh, tragic and heartbreaking, and we've been praying for her healing, um, and I was praying for her last night, and I genuinely, I'm like, God, I don't know what else to pray for this little girl. I've already asked you to do it, and so then I, then I start praying for her in tongues, and, and I genuinely feel like I'm praying things in alignment with the Spirit of God that maybe, maybe I simply do not know. Paul talks about it in the book of Romans chapter 8, like, like the Spirit of God groans with our spirit, and so it's a space of like the Spirit of God meeting us in a place where we don't necessarily know what to pray for. Um, and then another space it can come out of, and I, th- I would say this is where it started for me, is that you're just in a space of, of, of like full of worship and gratitude and, and just kind of praise spills out. Like it's, it's just the kind of natural expression of, of, of praising God. And so let's keep right down to 1 Corinthians 14, 39 real fast um, as we kind of land the plane here. Paul, Paul's wrapping up the chapter and he says, hey guys, listen. Be eager to prophesy, like it's important, lean in, that we want to have this, but don't forbid speaking in tongues. He's not down on it. He's just correcting their abuse of it, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way, and so he says, hey, when you gather, everything should be done for building up, so there's this, like what happens in your private life, and then what happens when you gather together in large and small groups, and so again, he's not down on this at all. He's saying, hey, but if it's going to happen in a gathering, it, there's got to be an interpretation, um, and so, listen, this is just a very different posture for Paul between tongues and prophecy. You, you guys have seen that, right? He's like, prophecy, you need it in the weekend gathering. You go back and listen to that teaching last week. Tongues, he says, be careful how you use it. Um, so a recap. This is one of the things the Spirit does. I'm going to let Daniel come up, and as we kind of land the plane here, just let me catch you up, okay? This is one of the pneumaticos, the stuff the Spirit does. Um, and, and I just want you to know, just like Paul, we are all for it. Okay, when it comes to the stuff the Spirit wants to do in and through you and I, we are all for it. And I would say in, in my heart that I could genuinely say with Paul, I wish you all did. 
because of the benefit that it has for your spirit. Now, I'm new to this, and I'm learning. Bo, Bo's in the room, and Kristen, Bo is uh, one of our partners for the InterVarsity on campus, and Bo, um, actually, the very first time that Bo ever prayed in tongues was at a night of worship and prayer here at City Church, which was really interesting. And he told me that, and I'm like, oh, cool, dude. <laughs> what do I do with that? And so, so we're, we're learning, right? We're like figuring it out together. Um, Paul's clear on, on some stuff, and so that's where we are. But Again, I think, like Paul, at a gathering, it's not necessarily the best place. I've never been in a, in a space where there's been a clear interpretation. So, again, let's take a step back. Paul's inviting us to, be eagerly, to eagerly desire all the stuff the Spirit does. And this is a command. This is not a suggestion. If you're a follower of Jesus, he says, hey, put your heart in a place where you want and you're desiring and you're asking God for and practicing all the stuff the Spirit does. And remember, this word, this is not like... I think I, I have this gift and not that one. He says, no, this is open to every follower of Jesus. And so where are we with this? I don't know where you are in the room. And if you're not a Jesus follower, you might be like, what the heck is happening? And it's okay. Like, stay tuned for just a minute because I, I get it. This might be left field for you. But, but some of you, your heart posture is maybe closed to this completely. Like, this is weird. And maybe you've seen abuse or it's just intimidating in general. And you're like, man, I don't want nothing to do with that. And I, and I totally get it. But I just want to remind you and me, like Paul's words are for us. In that space, hey guys, eagerly desire the stuff the Spirit does. Some of you are in that open but cautious zone. I think that's a majority of our church, even most of our leaders. It's kind of polling a lot of our city group leaders and staff this week. Open but cautious. And, and I would just evaluate where that caution comes from. Because I think God wants us to move past open into eager. That's the word we keep hearing, right? And so... If he's a good father who gives good gifts, you don't have anything to worry about. But Paul wants us to move into this heart posture of eager and open to all that God wants to do. Now, what's this look like? Because I'm sure that's what you're like thinking. You're like, cool, this is helpful, but, but how do we do this? And so let me just, if, if you're interested in pressing in and opening up your heart and mind to uh, just more of the stuff the Spirit does, again, this is everything, but specifically for the, the manifestation of, of praying in tongues, first, just create space for God to do this. Uh, that might be going on a hike, top of a mountain, alone, in your car, in the shower, go home and close your door. It doesn't really matter where you are, but create space in your life for God to do this and just ask, God, I, I want this. I, I would love to see the manifestation of the Spirit in my life through praying in tongues. And again, this is the, the ability to, I would love to pray and praise you in this way, to connect my spirit to yours at a deeper level. That, that's all you're asking. And, and then just create space for it. And worst case scenario, guys, worst case scenario, you create space, you ask God for it, and you say nothing. <laughs> and that's it. That's a pretty safe place to give it a shot. Uh, and and for, for what it's worth, this is not something superimposed on you. You don't just like start convulsing and like, no, that's not weird like that, right? You start volitionally speaking and the Spirit of God meets you in that space. And so, it's also kind of this space of practicing and pressing in. I'm learning. I, honest, I'll be honest with you guys if I can just like, so you're not so, you know, confused by it. Um, when I started, I like, I found myself genuine. I mean, I mean, it was like 30 minutes of genuine praise to God. And I was like, man, this is pretty cool. And then I started listening to myself. And I'm trying to like evaluate what's, what, what I'm praying. And then I stopped because I was like, this, is, this sounds ridiculous. <laughs> um, and so lately I have been praying like kind of under my breath um, to just, because my brain, I just can't, I'm a, I'm a skeptic on a good day, guys, right? And so I'm like, I gotta, I gotta like not hear myself as much just to get out of my way because I'll get in my head. And then I'm like, all right, God, what, what are we doing? So it's been kind of cool because I've been wrestling with that and, uh, and I found myself over and over again pressing back into it. So maybe you're in the room and like me, you tried. You've asked God for this and it's never happened. Uh, and I would say that was true of me for a really long time. Um, and again, don't be discouraged by that. First Corinthians 12, Paul said, hey, he does this to each one as he wills. It's open to everyone, but my encouragement for you was keep creating space, and if you want it, keep asking. Keep asking. And this is for all things. This is for prophecy, and next week I'm teaching on healing. This is for all things. Keep pressing in, keep creating space, and keep asking. And lastly, you might ask where. Where is this appropriate? And again, we, we talked about that like in a private space. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully you have time daily with God and, and scriptures and in prayer already, like you're pressing into those habits and those spaces. So that's a natural time for you to also 
practice this space and just open up your life to this manifestation of the Spirit. Um, in addition, worship, like Paul was talking about singing, you know, it's loud enough in the room that you can sing and open up yourself to singing and, and, and praying in tongues where no one else would even hear you, so you don't have to really worry about it, right? Like, we're not violating anything in that space. And so you're welcome to those spaces as you press in. But let, let me just encourage you with this last thing. This, this is not about seeking the spiritual high. This is not about an emotional experience. There's, there's nothing wrong with those things. That's not the goal. That's not what we're after here. You say, why, why, are, we, why are we here? The goal, Paul says, is to build up the church. That we're pressing into the stuff the Spirit does because we want to build up what God is doing in and through this community. And this is a gift that builds you up. And I know for many people in the room that I've talked to, you could use a space like that from time to time. Where, you, where you, your soul catches up with your body, where you're able to be present and, and just unplug from everything around you. The goal is that you and I are becoming the kind of people that when we gather in large and small groups, the shared experience, the shared sentiment is not great message, great music, cool orange carpet, bro. Like, it's not that, but it's wow, God is here. And we want that for your city groups. We want that for our weekend gatherings. Wow, God is here. That God would grow you and I to become all that he wants us to be for this community, for the city, and the world. So let me pray for you, and then we're going to go into a time of worship. Let me bow you. If, you, if you'll just take a second, bow your heads, close your eyes. That's just to kind of create a moment of privacy in your own heart and mind. And we're just going to quiet our hearts and minds for a moment. Jesus, this, uh, these conversations, they, they, they come with a lot of information. It kind of can feel like we're drinking out of a water hose at times or a fire hose, fire hydrant, one of those. <laughs> um, help us not to miss the bigger invitation. The invitation is to pursue love or to follow the way of love and to eagerly desire the stuff the Spirit does knowing that what you want to do in and through us is going to build others up. And I know for a fact, in this room, everyone could use some encouragement. Everyone could use an investment of being built up by someone else. And what's even more amazing is when that's connected to you, that we experience your love through others and you're working in and through this community. And so, Holy Spirit, bring our hearts and our minds back to that space that we are opening up our lives to you because you're good, because you love us, and you have more for us. This comes back to trusting in you. Jesus, if we can trust you with our souls to save us, to make us right with God, we should be able to trust you in other areas, so would you, would you stretch us in that? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed just for a moment, I'd just like to speak to, um, and if, if you're in the room and you're not a follower of Jesus, I'd like to speak just directly to you for a second to let you know that God loves you. And God has made that love evident completely through Jesus, the perfect Son of God, completely human and completely God, limiting himself of his divine attributes. He lived the life that you and I can't live perfectly without sin. Not only did he face that, that, this world and that brokenness, but then he died on the cross for my sin and for yours, this, this brokenness inside, inside of us, this stuff that separates us from a relationship with God. Jesus died willingly in our place for our sins on the cross. He was buried. And then to everyone's complete surprise, Jesus rose from the grave three days later, proving that he was who he said he was, that he can do in our lives what he said he would do, 
to save us, set us free, make us new, adopt us into the family of God, and empower our lives to be with him, become like him, and do what he did. And if you're not a follower of Jesus in the room, I want it to be abundantly abundantly clear. The invitation is very simply to trust in him today. That Jesus is God, he loves you, and he has made a way to have a relationship with God by, by offering forgiveness, by trusting in him. And if you've never done that, I'd encourage you to do it today. To have this incredible life that is truly life only found in Jesus.